soul and all that is within me bless his holy name thank you thank you blessed be the name of Jesus help us as we uh, spend a little time with the word today in Jesus mighty name we have prayed amen, amen. amen. we're going to talk about our God from Psalm 18 1 to 17 Psalm 18, 1 to 6, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength. Second time it says my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Second Corinthians in the New Testament 12 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Or in other words, God is speaking. My grace comes from me, therefore I am all sufficient for you. This is Christ speaking. Let's see what David has to say about him from the Old Testament. First Chronicles 16, uh, David is doing, uh, I believe it was a ceremony uh, or, or something like that, and, and he was giving special thanks to God. We're going to uh, hit several of the verses that he goes through here. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. That's verse 12. Verse 21, he permitted no man to do them wrong. 25, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. 29, give to the Lord the glory due his name. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. 34, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. 36. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Paderewski was a great pianist. Uh, people would pay big money to come and hear Paderewski play. And he was on a concert tour of 70 concerts around the world. Very uh, high up. You go to one of these functions and it's probably like black tie and, uh, you know, wearing tuxedos and, uh, you know, everybody's quiet until it's time to clap. Uh, I mean, you know, really uh, great high society kind of event. So at one of the concerts, it was very interesting when... 
a six-year-old little boy escaped his mother's grasp before the concert. She's talking with some of her high society friends and uh, he normally behaves himself, but he just wandered away and she didn't see where he was, didn't notice where he was, and all of a sudden she heard the sound of little fingers on a keyboard and looked up to the stage and her six-year-old boy was sitting at the maestro's uh, chair, the piano bench, and he started to play the chopsticks. I don't know if you've ever, most, if you've ever taken piano lessons, I haven't, but I've had family members that did, and they all learn the chopsticks. And I can't remember how it goes, but yeah, I think you use two fingers and you just, you play something and, and go back and forth, and it's called the chopsticks. And the little boy was playing, playing the chopsticks on Paderewski's piano in this high society event. And the woman was chagrined. She was crushed. Oh no, my, my goodness, I'm being totally embarrassed by my six-year-old child. Paderewski was about to come out anyway. So he came out from the side and he walked over in a moment he put one arm around the little boy on one side and he started adding in some notes. Then he put his other arm around the other side and he started adding in some more notes. He told the little boy, he said, keep playing. When Paderewski added some notes on both sides and had the little boy playing, it became a marvelous masterpiece. And when he was, in, when he was finished, the whole crowd rose up stood up and, and, and cheered and, and clapped because when the master came out, it became a masterpiece. We're talking about our God, the master. Let's let him make a masterpiece out of our little chopsticks in our life. Back to Psalm 18, one and two. David was looking back, thinking of what God means to him. In verse 1, he says, I will love you, O Lord. Adam Clark says, love always subsists on motive and reason. So David did not just love God because he knew him to be the supreme being, but because he was good to David. And then he goes into some of the details as to how he meant God was so good to him. God is my strength, he said. Now I mentioned as we were reading it, there's a my strength in verse 1 and there's a my strength in verse 2. They're different. Let's talk about them for a second. Adam Clark said, my strength, thou, God, thou who has given me power over my adversaries and hast enabled me to avoid evil and do good. The difference on this one, this is an external help against specific problems. So I'm working on a business problem and it's not coming together right. And I call out to my strength, my God, and he helps me. External help for specific problems. I'm a mechanic and I have a problem and I dropped a, a screw down in a place where I can't reach it and, and I'm frustrated this, this one screw is so important to my fixing the car, the engine, and I can't reach it and I call out to my strength, my God, external help for specific problems. And he literally can help us in those weird moments when we think, okay, God is a spirit. We talked about the angels this morning in Sunday school. And uh, it's interesting, it, it said it, there's talk about angels can go through doors like Jesus went through a door after he was risen from the dead. And yet angels slew 180,000. How does a spirit who walks through doors slay a human being who is a physical body? That's just one of the marvels of the supernatural God of the universe. My strength, my God, my external help. He can do things that we don't think 
We have to learn to train our minds to call on our God my strength because he can intervene. But my rock. Nelson's expository dictionary says rock from the Hebrew to sir frequently is used to picture God's support and defense of his people. Deuteronomy 32.4, speaking of God, says he is the rock. His work is perfect. Adam Clark says, I stand on him as my foundation and derive every good from him who is the source of good. Another connotation of the word rock from the original is cliff or overhanging precipice providing shelter for man or beast where even bees made nests and honey. Deuteronomy 32, 13 talks about honey from the rock. Well, where would you get honey from a rock? Because bees, bees hang in that overhanging precipice and they build their nests there and they make honey. This is our God. My rock. David is saying, like the overhanging precipice that actually even provides sustenance, honey, sweet sustenance, this is our God, the rock. He's my fortress. Adam Clark says David refers to these inaccessible heights in the Rocky Mountainous country of Judea where he had often found refuge from the pursuit of Saul. He is saying, what these have been to my body, the Lord has been to my soul. The Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. He's my deliverer. Adam Clark, he who causes me to escape from very close situations. Remember, David escaped the javelin. Saul was so angry. David was there playing the harp, trying to soothe Saul. And, but Saul was jealous and angry because this David was getting praise from people that he was thinking, I should get that praise. And he was angry and he picked up a javelin. He wanted to kill David and he was good. He was a man of war. He picked up that javelin and he threw it. And David saw just in time to dodge it. It missed him by just a few inches. And then David ran up and uh, climbed out the window in Michael, uh, Saul's daughter, who had become his wife. He climbed out the window and barely escaped with his life. My deliverer. I remember many years, speaking of escaping from narrow situations, many years ago I was going to Bible college in Illinois and we lived, uh, my family lived in Detroit, Michigan. So I was traveling at Christmas time back to Detroit, Michigan. Now, it doesn't get as much here as it did in the Midwest or does in the Midwest. Uh, at Christmas time, it was a, a blizzard, a snow blizzard. The roads were rough. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have been driving, but I was trying to travel through the night to get home for Christmas time. There was snow on the roads. They weren't terrible. As a young person, I was probably going faster than I should have been, but I would have been fine if nobody pulled in front of me. I was traveling in the left lane because there was a semi, a lorry in the right lane. And so as I came to pass the lorry, somebody pulled out from behind the semi to go around the semi right in front of me. And I was going too fast I don't know if they didn't see me or what, but I just knew that in a moment I was going to be in a bad accident. And I like whispered, oh God. And just at the last second when I was sure the crunching of metal was going to happen and spinning around and landing in a ditch, piles of snow, at the last second, I didn't even know how it happened. I didn't steer the car. I, it, to me, it was pretty much over. At the last second, here's the semi and here's the car. A tiny space opened up just in time. And like I said, I didn't steer the car. It was like God's hand moved my car between that space to in front of the semi and beside of the other car. 
and we narrowly escaped what could have been a tragic accident. My deliverer. Isaiah 59, 19b says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. He's my God. Adam Clark says, this is from Eli, the, the word for God, meaning my strong God. Not only the object of my adoration, but he puts strength in my soul. Here's the second, my strength, in verse 2. Adam Clark says this one is from the Hebrew word tesurai, which comes from tesur. We talked about that a minute ago, my rock. This, this one comes from tesur, meaning rock. When applied to God, this signifies fountain, source, or origin. In other words, God is not only the source whence my being was derived. God's the one that created us. He's not just the source whence my being was derived, but he is the fountain whence I derive all my good, in whom David says, I will trust. And why? Because he knew him to be an external, an eternal, inexhaustible fountain of goodness. Remember, there's a difference. The first verse, he's an external help against specific problems. In verse 2, we find he is a fountain, something within that keeps on giving. This is our God. He's my shield. From the Hebrew word meaning my shield, my defender, he who covers my head and my heart so that I am neither slain nor wounded by the darts of my adversaries. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress is a book that was written in 1678 by a guy by the name of John Bunyan. 1678 many, many years ago. I'm going to read a few passages from it. You'll notice that uh, even the translator left kind of some of that old King James English in there, uh, even the spellings. I copied the spellings from the book. You'll notice they look like they're spelled wrong if you look on the screen. But in the book, Pilgrim's Progress, it's an allegory about uh, a Christian, about our life. From the time of being awakened spiritually, before we even become a Christian, we're just awakened spiritually, and conviction of sin is, is happening, and then our journey through until we get to the celestial city, heaven. There's a, a number of uh, words in the Bible used for the devil, for Satan. One is Apollyon. And so the writer, John Bunyan, uses Apollyon for the devil uh, when he's being, when he's confronting uh, Christian. Christian is the name of the main character. So here's a, a quote. Then did Christian begin to be afraid. This is when he saw Apollyon coming. This is the first time he actually saw Apollyon coming. Apollyon, in this example, was a mean looking like a dragon, big dragon wings, and he looked uh, ugly and scary. And Christian began to be afraid and thought whether to go back or to stand his ground. But he considered again that he had no armor for his back. We need to remember this in our Christian life because. We have armor. The New Testament talks about breastplate of righteousness and uh, uh, shoes and, and different things. And we'll probably have a sermon about that sometime. But with all this armor, we are fortified to fight. We are not fortified for running because there's no armor for our back. Mm -hmm. And Christian said, I better fight. Because I don't have any protection for my back. When Apollyon couldn't draw Christian in with seductive words, he decided to try his big guns. First, he tried to woo him in, talk sweetly to him. Oh, are you sure you want to do this? Hey, I'll give you blessings and I'll help you. Let, let's go back to your, your home city. Didn't work. So he pulled out the big guns. And he was trying to scare him to death. Then Paul, Apollyon straddled, I told you about those, uh, I copied these words directly from the, the writing. Uh, Apollyon 
straddled quite over the whole breadth of the way, and he said, I am void of fear in this matter. Prepare thyself to die, for I swear by my infernal den that thou shalt go no further. Here will I spill thy soul. And with that he threw a flaming dart at his breast. But Christian had a shield. God is my shield. The battle rages on and Apollyon does inflict some heavy wounds on Christian and eventually even knocks his sword out of his hand and has nearly defeated him. But our God intervenes and helps him to regain his sword and wound him, saying, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Even if we stumble, even if we fall, we will. We're human. We'll struggle sometimes. We'll fall sometimes. Don't run. We don't have any armor for our back. But when we fall, I will arise. Determination moving forward. I'm going through this. I'm not running. And he said, I shall arise. And he follows that with, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. God is also the horn of my salvation. The horn was the emblem of power. Thus, horn of my salvation means a powerful and efficient salvation. He not only saves me from sin, he's powerful enough to meet my every burden, trial, temptation. He's my high tower. Now, I was using the New King James for most of this quotation. I went back to the Old King James for this one. Because the New King James, for this one, it says stronghold. And I like stronghold. Uh, that, that's fine. God is my stronghold. He's a pl place where I can dwell securely. But high tower has a little bit different, different connotation. Not only a place of defense. But a high tower is one from which I can discern the country round about me and always be able to discover danger before it gets there, before it approaches me. This is our God. He is our high tower. Not just a stronghold, but a high tower from which we, we can look across the horizon and see what's coming. God sees that. God knows these things. He is our high tower. He knows any danger, trial, temptation, etc. before it reaches us, and he prepares us for it. Song by Martin Luther. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood, a mortal ill's prevailing. My God in action. So what does he do? Psalm 18, 6 to 17 covers some of this stuff. In verse 6, remember, we already talked about this one a little bit. David says, in my distress, I call upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. And this is what my all-powerful, awesome, wonderful Lord did to deliver me from my distress. My God in action. Verse 7, then the earth shook and trembled. Now there's some poetic language here he uses to describe what the Lord can do to defend us, help us, uh, help us get through our problem, defeat our enemy. It's poetic language, but don't, don't deceive yourself. These are things that God could literally do if he needed to, to answer your prayer. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. You had, did you ever get angry when somebody was picking on your child? Somebody was doing something bad to your child and you caught it out of the corner of your eye and you turned around and you said, what are you doing? Righteous anger comes up inside of you. We are his child. This is what he can do because he's angry. The enemy is picking on my child. Smoke 
went up from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and he flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Obviously an ominous, formidable creature being our God. The enemy, the enemy doesn't want to tangle with our God. When we call on our, the enemy likes to tangle with us. If he can get us off to the side and we've left our God to the other side, he likes to tangle with us. But when we call on the resources of heaven, our God, he's there. The enemy doesn't like to tangle with our God. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. Again, hailstones and coals of fire. If he needs them, he's got hailstones and coals of fire to answer our prayers. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. But they weren't too strong. When we realize we can't handle our problems alone, we get ourselves in alignment with the almighty God of the universe and we turn our problems over to him, just look what he can do. It's not a wonder that David said in verses 29 to 31, for by you, God, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? A song the Lord gave me many years ago. My body and soul get surrounded by things attractive, alluring, but wrong. I know I will lose by depending on self, so I flee to you, Lord, and I'm safe. Oh, I hide in I hide in you, Jesus. I hide in you. I want your control in my body and soul. So, Jesus, I hide in you. My sin and old nature were nailed to the cross. All I need do is take part in the plan. You were crucified for me. The victory was won. I must only rest in your care. Oh, I hide in I hide in you. I want your control in my body and soul. So Jesus, I hide in you. I hide in you, Lord, 
as I die to myself, I reckon myself dead to sin. When I know I'm weak, it's then that you make me strong. I love how your word really works. Oh, I hide in body and soul, so Jesus, I have.